Hi, everyone, and welcome to Center for Healthy Sex, Mirror of Intimacy, Daily Reflections on Emotional and Erotic Intelligence webinar. I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and today is Monday, July 19th. So um, today's topic is laughter. Um, and our quote today is from Joanne Woodward, who was a famous actress from... I was, I want to say the 60s, but could be earlier. Um, she says, sexiness wears thin after a while and beauty fades. But to be married to a man who makes you laugh every day, ah, now that's a real treat. Um, and I love that uh, quotation mark from her because laughter and humor are play states. And if we can't play with our mates, it means that we don't have a vitality state that's going on. Um, if we're stressed out, if we're resentful, um, if we're angry um, or depressed or anxious, it's very difficult to play. Play is part of how we engage socially. Um, laughter is part of the social engagement system also. So whenever the human organism is under any kind of distress, um, it's very difficult to be in these play states. And laughter is usually spontaneous when it happens, right? If you are um, watching a good movie and it's funny, you just automatically burst forth into laughter. It's not something that you can make happen. Like if I suggested we all laugh right now, it would be sort of stilted and weird. And maybe we would just laugh at how weird it was that we were trying to laugh. But there's something about that full bodied expression of amusement uh, that really transports us into a full blown joy state. And I worry today, especially, you know, living with this pandemic, that we just haven't been laughing enough, that uh, we were in a fear state last year at this time, um, maybe a terror state, you know, in February, March of 2020. Um, and as we've been coming out slowly but surely and increasingly more, um, I think people are wanting to laugh more. They're wanting to play more. They're wanting to get out into the world and engage more. And when we laugh out loud, the body is physically heaving. You, you know what that experience is like. We release sounds, we release movements, we gesticulate in a way, and we're <clears throat> communicating with other people. It doesn't matter um, whether you even speak the same language, you can burst into laughter with somebody about something you see that strikes you as funny. And in that moment, we are in a high level of attunement with the other. Uh, we're entertaining ourselves and the other person. Um, and we're in this vitality state that Joanne Woodward talks about is so, so important. But when we... Um, but when we do laugh, it doesn't matter what the source of laughter is. It can come from a best friend. It can come from a lover. It can come from a funny movie or TV show that you're watching. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. It, it will increase our sense of well-being. And um, <clears throat> I just was wondering if anybody's ever had that experience where you start laughing out loud and you're by yourself even because you just saw something that you thought was hilarious or something hilarious happened. And then, you know, you try to recount the story and it's not so funny. Um, so think about those times also, those self-amusing times um, when you're kind of tickling yourself or you're seeing something is ironic. Um, those are some of the most special moments we can actually have with ourselves. And our humor, I think, comes out of our, um, I would say our intelligence, but it's also our individuality, our quirkiness. When we meet people that share our sense of humor, I don't know that there's anything better than that um, because we're laughing um, in a way where we're both seeing the world in the same way. And there's nothing worse than um, going out with somebody or being on a date or <clears throat> spending some time with someone who just doesn't get your humor at all. Everything just kind of falls flat and none, none of it feels very interesting. So we can consider that laughter and medicine are really, or laughter and play are good medicine. And we've heard that over and over throughout our lives that um healing um, and laughter heals a lot. 
And when we think about the doldrums, the doldrums are actually a state on the sea where the wind's not blowing. And if you have a sailboat and the wind's not blowing, you're not going to go anywhere. And sometimes the doldrums can last for days or weeks on the high seas. And um, historically, pirates and um, boats and ships on the high seas would suffer gravely uh, because there was no wind. And so when we're in the doldrums metaphorically ourselves, we really need a laugh with somebody. Um, so it's important to not take yourself too seriously and not to take life so seriously that you can't have a good laugh now and then. And I was curious about the last time you had a hearty belly laugh um, and think about when that was. Um, who did you laugh with the hardest or what made you laugh so hard that it was side splitting and that you were crying and then you're at a place sometimes where you don't even know what you are laughing about. So take a moment to think about when was the last time I had a really hearty side splitting crying laugh um, and you might not remember what it was about but who were you with. See if you can take a minute to think about that. And if you can't remember where you were or who you were with or when that happened, then that means you haven't done it in a long time. And um, those moments don't come around that often. Certainly we laugh with people a lot, but those big, big overcoming side splitting laughs um, are often few and far between. And then think about what happens if you deprive yourself of this essential source of vitality. What happens to you? Because laughter is like sex. Laughter is a full-bodied, um, effervescent, um, extraordinary neurochemical shift in the system that is essential for our health and well-being. And when we think about sex, we rarely think about laughter. Um, it's always portrayed to us in movies and films as um, something dour or something serious or something really torrid or super erotic and sexy in a certain way. Um, play states are rarely uh, portrayed when it comes to sex and sexuality. And sex is, um, you know, it is a form of play. It's a form of adult play when we think about it. So when was the last time you played with your lover in bed, whether it was tickling or being coy or playing some sort of hide and seek game with each other, uh, whether it was with your eyes or with your body? Um, when do you allow that sort of lightheartedness as part of your sexuality? And do you consider that sexy? Um, and if not, why not? Because when you allow yourself a full expression in sex without self-consciousness, you'll find yourself goofing away in ways that you never really considered that may get you and your partner laughing. And to be able to travel through those crescendos um, and then to decrescendo de down into something more heartfelt or connected. Not that laughter and play are not heartfelt, they are. But to go from laughter, let's say, high amounts of laughter and goofing around, to starting to kiss and make out and feel the arousal in the body requires a fluid sense of self. It requires a resilience internally. It requires a lack of shame and self-judgment where you're not watching yourself any every two minutes to make sure you look cool or um, you've got the right moves going or something like that. So this playing does require a secure sense of self um, so that your partner's laughter or their goofiness or their levity uh, doesn't feel like they're making fun of you or that you're being condescended to. Um, you really have to be resilient in order to tolerate this kind of laughter during sex. And insecure couples can have difficulty expanding their sexual repertoire to include play and laughter and fun. Um, and these restrictions can really impinge on our um, ideas about attractiveness and what we think sex is supposed to look like. And then sex can become very rote or rigid or um, boxed in in a particular way. And so I'm curious if anybody has any questions at this point about 
how laughter and play um, get incorporated into sex and maybe what stands in the way of that for you. Um, so someone's asking about giving examples and are you talking about examples of laughter and play or something else? Examples of what? See what he says. I mean, one of the examples I just gave a minute ago um, about laughter. Okay, so if you are um, starting sexual play, for example, um, that's generally uh, where it would come into. And consider that laughter is play. It's a play state. Um, and so if you and your partner are starting to get sexual with each other, and maybe it comes in the form of flirtation, or um, you've just been hanging out and you decide you want to have sex. So you start to tickle your partner and they tickle you back or you throw a pillow at them and they throw a pillow back. Um, and now you're laughing because you're having a pillow fight or you're playing tag, you're chasing each other around the bed. Um, these are play states and they can be really fun and they're alive in states also. I would go as far as to call them arousal states in the body. And that doesn't mean you're genitally aroused. You might be if it's a sexual partner, but the arousal in the autonomic nervous system in the body is moving towards the kind of arousal that we have sexually also. Um, so think about the way that children play um, when they play in these kind of unbridled, outrageous ways, um, they either start imitating creatures um, or they evoke imaginary characters or they pretend they're superheroes. Um, there's no limit on how they play. Um, and so this can't be prescribed. It might be that you do something silly like pick up your partner's shirt and turn it into a cape and then you fly onto the bed um, or any number of things that just catch your eye in the moment um, that allows for spontaneity and it allows for a creativity that folds into the sexuality. Um, so you're starting from a place of not just feeling like you have to um, arouse your partner, you got your, get your partner in the mood. All of that can feel so laborious and um, dour even uh, because it feels obligatory to getting sex started. And so if you can find creative ways to get sex started that have to do with these play states, um, then you'll have a different experience. And um, these kind of play states start to break up our ideas of what sex should look, look like. And increasingly, I've been, you know, considering and thinking about just how different sex is for everybody. I mean, every single person has a different version of what arouses them, what their fantasies are, the way they like to be touched, um, the way they like to kiss. Um, the way they like to be held, the kind of pressure they want on their body, on their genitals. Um, this is an incredibly vast array of sexual preferences and they're as different as all of our fingerprints are different. So experimenting with these states for yourself and with your partner are ways to start to find novelty and bring novelty into your sex life as well. Um, someone writes, how can we initiate sexual play or just play in general without our romantic partners or with our romantic partners? It seems something that happens spontaneously and can't really be planned. I think that's true, but um, it can start spontaneously if you're spontaneous. So if you're with your sexual partner and it's Saturday afternoon and you're in the kitchen and um, you've just had lunch and you get up and um, you do something playful to your partner, um, whereas you, you tickle them or you um, grab them and say you're it and then you run around the counter and they have to come chase you, you're initiating the play and the play does become spontaneous in that moment. Um, so it's about how creative you want to be um, and how uh, mischievous you are. There's a mischievous quality to play that's non-threatening, that's inviting the play state. Um, so it's, it's like you're trying to get your partner engaged in the play. And if your partner is open and spontaneous also, they'll pick up that cue and play with you. 
uh, someone says we're working through betrayal in our coupleship. So there's this line where su the subject of laughter can become triggering. How can I help my partner feel heard and held without losing the play state? Um, well, I think that is a, a very tricky thing. Um, and this is uh, when there has been intimate betrayal, you have to know the timing of where you are in the process of healing and repair before you can start to evoke play states because the person who was betrayed can read that as you're trying to get me just to get over this and I'm not over it and I'm not going to be. So that can just evoke anger. Uh, so you have to be mindful about you know, how long ago was the discovery? How much repair work has been done? Um, have you been through a disclosure process? Are you being sexual again? And can you talk to your partner about play and laughter? And that that is a way that you want to connect with them because um, you want to see them feeling lighthearted and you want to be lighthearted with them because you've been through so much hell actually. So this should be a conversation between the two of you before you just try to evoke it and have your partner read it as a manipulation um, or some kind of seduction to get them to drop whatever it is they're actually feeling. So this can take a long time, but it's really the bellwether of healing that if you cannot have play states, that means that you really haven't gotten to a point of forgiveness in the coupleship and a point of healing. Um, and that is a whole other conversation about what are we actually doing here? If we can't get over this hump, um, if we can't eventually put this behind us, and move forward, then that is going to be problematic. Because without connectedness, without a real connection with your partner, um, you can't have great sex. Uh, you'll be going through the motions of sex, but you will not be able to have sex that feels um, really connected again, where there is a sense of consideration and respect. Um, and with that comes play um, and laughter. And so you've got to really be gauging this and be in conversation with each other about it. Um, so, all right. So I think those are the only questions we have here. Um, so play is also how we learn. Um, and one of the ways we learn, when you think about what happened to kids during COVID this past year, um, and how terribly they all did in school. Um, if you look at, you know, sort of the bell curve, the majority of kids were on a downhill slope because they didn't have their friends to play with. And it doesn't matter if they were five or 15. Um, play states, again, are laughter, connecting, uh, goofing around with each other. And all of that makes learning so much easier than just staring into a computer all day long and just doing the dry rote work of um, academics. Um, and so kids got depressed, they got anxious because they missed their play friends. And we miss our play friends and our lovers also. Uh, when we think about our lovers in that way, we're not just thinking about them in this kind of genital to genital contact um, that's almost purely pornographic and about getting off. We're thinking about a full body experience with someone that includes all the attributes I spoke about earlier, that people who have great sex talk about how important the connection is with their lover, that they read each other, that they have empathy for each other, that they feel their way through the sexual connection, um, that they build fantasies together and that they can hear their fantasies without judgment, but with curiosity and interest in who the person is. And even within fantasy, there can be laughter or goofiness. Um, like if somebody's going to tell somebody a fantasy, they might say, look, this might sound really weird or funny to you, but this is the thing that turns me on the most. And can you hear that and be curious about it instead of being judgmental about it or off-putting about it? Uh, someone writes, how do you toe the line between silly laughing moments and the desire for seriousness during intimacy? Well, 
I think you have to watch yourself. If you're someone who makes joke about everything, then you want to look at what makes you so uncomfortable that you have to joke about everything. Because joking about serious moments, about close and intimate moments is just poor timing. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. And that becomes a breach to real intimacy, uh, the depth of the love you feel for someone, the depth of you know, the experience you have of this person that you really wouldn't know what to do without if something horrible happened to them. Um, sometimes we can feel how profoundly deeply we love um, that it scares us. And so we want to wiggle out of that feeling instead of express it to our partner in the form of I love you so much. Um, that's a big thing to say to someone. And that is not the time when you want to interrupt it with um, something silly. Um, I'm talking about these moments that are sort of pre-coital moments, moments when you're romping around in bed uh, before or even afterwards. I let's say you've had sex, um, and that's the time when you start to goof around with each other and play, and um, whether it's, you know, again, tag, pillow fighting, hide and seek, um, you know, playing with food, feeding each other food, tickling. Um, these are just goofy, outrageous things, or they can come in the form, as I said, of something super spontaneous in the moment um, that, you know, couples come up with that I can't really describe in the moment or think about. But hopefully most of you have had that experience where you have a spontaneous moment where you have a good giggle or laugh with someone. But be mindful about using laughter as a way to get out of intimacy as a way to build intimacy, kind of on the front end or the back end. Now, that's not to say that during sex, something really funny might happen, where somebody's trying to get their leg somewhere and it's not really going in that direction or um, something like outrageous happens with one of your small children outside the door. Um, so you just have to rule with what's going on. And that level of spontaneity in sex is what makes it more human, more real, and what takes the pressure and expectations off of what it's supposed to look like, or um, self-consciousness, and those sorts of things that really can make the sex and the sexual experience feel quite stilted and quite regimented and um, predefined. Um, so let yourself just play and be resilient and flexible and see what comes up for you. Um, and sometimes it's a good idea to get together with a group of people or when you are together with a group of people to see if you can just start laughing and engaging your body and stamping your feet and shaking your arms and moving yourself into a spontaneous laughter state and see if everybody can start to get into that laughter state with you. Uh, there is such a thing called contagion between human beings. When one person starts laughing, everybody starts laughing. So you can evoke laughter with a group or with your family. Um, and that's a laughter exercise, actually. And see if you're willing to try that and try it with a partner and see how far it goes. And you may just end up laughing at how dumb that experience of trying to laugh is. You may want to also try with your next sexual experience um, to start to evoke one of these spontaneous play states and let your partner know that you're going to do it uh, to begin with. Or maybe the two of you come up with something that you think is fun or funny or something that you already know is. Um, you know what happens if you reach towards your partner and you start to tickle him or her. They either respond to it or they push you away or they start to come after you. And that's the beginning of a play state. I'm talking about healthy sexuality. I'm talking about sexuality that um, enlivens you and your coupleship and your relationship, about sexuality that brings vitality states to it. Um, that allows you to be playful, to be careful, to be considerate, to be respectful, to be lustful, uh, to be animalistic, uh, to be passionate and sweet and kind, so that you're painting with all of the colors of the rainbow, 
when it comes to sex and sexuality and not just narrowing it down into this effort or this pressure that ultimately accumulates with some kind of penetrative sex and some kind of orgasm. That there are many, many different ways that people can be sexual with each other. They can play with each other. You know, I think what happens with couples and what happens with them when they're in long-term relationships is um, they start keeping score about how many times they've had sex. And sex means penetrative intercourse of some sort. Um, and that can just be so much pressure um, and um you know, sort of an unfairness on all of us to perform that it makes sex exhausting. And so I'm suggesting that sex in the form of play, sex in the form of affection and hugging and holding each other, sex in the form of mutual masturbation or um, just being together in some ways is sufficient enough to make that connection, to build a connection until, you know, maybe you do end up having intercourse, but to let your imagination run wild and to be more open and fluid in what your ideas of sex and sexuality are. Uh, someone writes here, many of my personal sexual experience have been involved with men who have had a more serious carnal idea of what sex should be like. No laughing, no play, just pornographic like sex. The idea of having a more playful state during sex seems like a daunting but well worth task to take. Thank you. Yes. And so I think that's partially uh, that maybe the men that you were involved with, but also the messages that we get about sex and sexuality, that men have to show up in this particular kind of way. They've got to perform and make it happen. Um, and there's no place for their, them to be boys, to play, to be um, sweet and innocent and kind themselves. Um, that we think of that as sort of traditionally feminine energy, but we all possess both the masculine and the feminine. And if we evoke all of these different self states internally, then we become much more multidimensional and the pressure to perform is off. Um, and so people have less struggle with you know, erectile dysfunction because they have less anxiety, especially males about getting an erection. And so instead they can just be. And so maybe they're laughing and you're in a play state um, and that is arousing. It's an arousal state and somebody sort of naturally gets an erection without trying to get an erection, without forcing it. Um, and, or they don't at all because something else happens instead on that afternoon or evening. So I'm inviting you to take the pressure off of your sex life to see if you can lighten it a little bit, um, to make it more fun, to make it more playful, um, and to, to, in, to create an elasticity, if you will, in your definition of what sex and sexuality is. So it isn't just about penetration or genital to genital contact. Um, play in other ways of connecting sexually is especially important after prostatectomy. I'm sure that's true. So if you've had any kind of prostate issues or cancer, um, any kind of surgery on the body, uh, that kind of exploration of the body, play states, um, massage, um, tickling, uh, playing with feathers or oils or um, maybe even a sex toy is so much more enriching um, than just starting from the same place time and time again. Um, and whenever anybody's had any kind of infirmity um, or even with age and time, um, that kind of touching, caressing, uh, deep curiosity about your partner and what they like is what changes our sex lives. And it's crucial to remember that, you know, bodies shift and change from day to day, month to month, year to year. So what your partner likes sexually yesterday or last week may not be what they're in the mood for today. So checking in with your partner, having a conversation about what they want, what they like, what they're feeling aroused by today um, is a great way to start sex. And that is a place state by saying, so today is Monday. It's almost 80 degrees today. We're in the dead of summer. What would turn you on today? And maybe your partner says a banana popsicle would turn me on today. So you go get banana popsicles before you meet at home tonight. Um, and that's the beginning of the play state. 
uh, that you have banana popsicles together. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to illustrate for you. These are not sex acts per se. They are ways of engaging with each other prior to becoming sexual that invites kind of a lighthearted, spontaneous sexuality that isn't prescribed. Um, so somebody's writing here that um, I heard about men being so afraid of play states in their marriage that they would have affairs, not understanding why, but that they were craving play states and thought they could only get that with their mistresses and that their wives were only meant to be mothers to their children and be divine. I'm learning with your center that sex and sexuality is divine and so much of society's conditioning is about shame. That's true. And this idea that, um, you know, you can only have play states with your lover. Well, can you turn your wife or husband into your lover? This is the biggest challenge that we have today in sex therapy. As people have been together for 15, 20, 25 plus years, and they come in and their sex is boring and they don't wanna have sex because it's not really sex worth having. Um, and so how do we infuse novelty in our sex lives? And we do that be, by becoming deeply interested in our partners. Um, somebody just wrote, I love that question. What would turn you on today? You know, if you ask me that question on some days, I don't know because I'm not thinking about it. I'm busy working and answering phone calls and emails and a million other things. Um, and that's, that's one of the unfortunate things in our very busy world is we don't stop to think about what turns me on today? What is my fantasy today? How am I feeling today? You know, on a day when you're just super tired, what might turn you on would be a foot massage, right? Something simple like that. On another day when it's sweltering hot, um, a banana popsicle um, or whatever your favorite flavor is. And so let yourself wander and creative and think about if you asked an eight-year-old, um, a, that question, not what turns you on today, but what would make you the most happy today? What would make you joyous today? They would tell you, right? They want to go play on a slip and slide in the backyard. Um, so let's go in the backyard and I'll hose you down or we'll have a hose fight um, if you don't have a pool, right? Let yourselves think outside the box that way and not be so uptight. We, we wear this armor of adulthood, like, oh, I can't do that because I'm a certain age, or what would my kids think, or my neighbors, or um, all of this sort of judgment that lives in our head that really perpetrates violence on us and doesn't allow us to be free um, and to have fun. And I can't think of a better season to have fun and to play than summer. Right, summer's always been the indicator for um, school times gone. There's no school during the summer, and so that lets us stay up later and sleep later and watch movies and um, have cookouts and hang out with friends and go to the beach. And to uh, allow adult play into that is really a way of kind of reframing things and re constituting the way we think about adulthood. So adulthood is not about being careless or being childish. It's about being childlike um, and inviting that childlike part of ourselves out to play so we don't feel so restricted. We're all burdened with so much responsibility on any given day, um, especially if you have children and you're working and making a living and keeping a roof over your house, that when the weekend rolls around or you've got weeknights and the days are longer now, um, to let yourself, it's not just about recreating, it's about playing while you're recreating. So if your recreation is um, to golf, then go golf and be goofy and have some laughs about it. Uh, don't be so serious and dour about everything. So on that note, since we don't have any more questions, I'm going to remind you to have a playful day and a playful week and to see if you can invoke play with one person today, whether it's a coworker where you make a joke um, or you go home and you say to your partner, um, you know, you want to, you're going to chase them around the house or something along those lines, whatever comes to you, but let yourself be yourself and talk to your partner about wanting to evoke more play in your life, more play in your sexuality, um, and see what happens. 
So I hope you have a good July and I look forward to talking to you in August. And again, you can reach us at centerforhealthysex.com. Um, if you'd like to talk to anybody about sex, love or relationships, you can call us at 310-843-9902. And I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis and I look forward to talking to you soon.